Open your Bibles with me, please, to Revelation chapter 22, the very end of the book. And yes, today we're going to look at the very last paragraph of the book, but not quite done. God willing, next week we'll do a, a one-hour helicopter flyby overview of the whole book, just sort of to, to wrap it up. And then I have a couple of uh, topical messages in mind that we'll do for a couple of weeks. And then, are we ready for a change of pace from, from prophecy, from Revelation? We're going to do Ruth, the little Old Testament book of Ruth, a very, uh, a very different uh, uh, type of scripture than what we've been talking about. Um, Last week, I, uh, I began by, by making fun of the people that were trying to claim that the eclipse was caused by global warming. You know, <laughs> God makes fun of idolaters in several passages in Scripture, particularly in Isaiah. Um, last week, I also mentioned just briefly the, the current event that had happened then the night before. Tomorrow is the Chosen People Ministries Passover Seder. I get the regular uh, email updates from Chosen People Ministry, and uh, an email that came into my inbox this week had a, a perspective on the exchange of, uh, of, of missiles between Israel and Iran. Israel was uh, targeted uh, last Saturday, and they replied a day or two ago. The Iranians and their proxies in Lebanon and in Yemen sent over 300 different kinds of missiles and drones and so on at Israel. Three different levels of three intended to overwhelm Israel's attack, Israel's defenses. And God in his providence protected his people. There was exactly one serious injury in Israel, from uh, all of that barrage of missiles, including enormous ballistic missiles. Um, there was a, a 12-year-old veteran girl that was hit by falling debris from one of the missiles that had been shot down. And last I heard, she was severely injured, still in critical condition, but that, that, that was the only uh, major casualty. And then... All the nations in the world, including ours, told Israel, all right, um, um, uh, back off, uh, uh, you need to stand down. <laughs> if any other nation, if any neighboring nation fired 300 missiles at us, would we stand down? The nation of Israel fired back at Iran, and they fired back with a pinprick small response. You know what they took out? They took out Iran's air defenses. Iran had purchased from Russia the best defenses that were available, and Israel's defenses succeeded. Iran's defenses were taken out. You know where Iran's radar and anti-missile defenses were located? Near their nuclear facilities, Israel's moderate response was just to point out that your nuclear facilities are vulnerable to us. How does that play into Bible scripture, Bible prophecy? Well, a few weeks ago, I shared with you a, a magazine cover that talked about Israel alone. The good news is that when Israel was uh, bombarded the other day, they were not alone. Our nation and the UK, and France, and some of their neighboring Arab nations helped them with their defense in different ways. So that particular prophecy isn't completely there yet. We're not there yet. We don't have to um, act like it might be tomorrow, although Jesus' return could be any moment. Another aspect of it, though, Zechariah predicts in chapter 12 and chapter 14 that Israel is going to be a problem to all the nations. In a sense, it already is. The United Nations spends more time denouncing Israel than anything else. When and if Israel is provoked enough to take out Iran's nukes, boy, is that going to stir up a hornet's nest. How should we respond to all this stuff? The sky is falling, let's panic. 
No, Jesus told us in Luke, when you see these things taking place, lift up your heads, look up, for it means the day of your redemption is near. Jesus is coming back. Read with me the last chapter of the book of Revelation, and we will overlap a little bit, but we're going to look at the last paragraph of the last chapter. Revelation chapter 22. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be any night. And they will not have the need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Verse 8. I, John... And the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy, and let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Verse 12, behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you sent this book, you sent this message to be written in this book to testify to the churches. We thank you that we can be recipients of your grace and also that we can share your grace, the truth of your grace to others. Lord, I thank you that Jesus is coming quickly and that we can live in an attitude of readiness no matter what the time, no matter what the generation that we are in. Lord, I pray that as we look at these promises, we would be challenged to put into practice the challenges that are here in this passage. 
Lord, I ask that you would speak through me and help me to be clear. I pray that you would speak in each of our hearts through your Holy Spirit, that you would draw us to yourself and challenge us to make changes in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to overlap a little bit with last week's passage. And in looking through this passage and thinking about how to, uh, to present it and highlight it to you, in one sense, it's a, it's a wrap-up. It's a postscript. And so it's not laid out in a way that, that's readily easy to outline. And yet what's here and what matters most to us are the challenges, the instructions, the commands. Some of them are spelled out and some of them are clearly implied by the teachings in this passage. And I've chosen to uh, share it with you in the format of highlighting the commands because in a sense that's what matters anyway. Do we study the book of Revelation to uh, uh, disagree with others that have different views? Do we study the book of Revelation in order to Get panicky about things are going from bad to worse. Yes, things will go from bad to worse before Jesus comes back. It says so. We study the book of Revelation because we're promised a blessing if we study it and read it and heed it and do it and put it into practice. What is there that we can put into practice from this passage? We looked briefly at verses 10 and 11 last week. I'm not going to go into detail with them again, but the challenge here obviously is to keep yourself holy because the time is near. You see that phrase, the time is near in verse 11, and repeatedly through the chapter is the statement that I am coming quickly. We talked about it last week. This is review. How do we deal with the fact that it says he's coming quickly? And the time is near when we're in the year 2024. The Apostle Peter addressed that question head on in 2 Peter chapter 3 and said, God's not slow. He's being patient with you and he views time differently. You see the reference there, 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9. God is not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. The time is near, and we are to be keeping ourselves holy. Read with me again verse 11. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. The one who is filthy still be filthy. Let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. To the individuals that choose to reject God, God says, okay, have it your way. Go do your thing. But to us, he says, keep on practicing righteousness. Keep on being holy. And we'll come back to that because we come back to it again a little bit later on down in the passage. But notice now verse 12. Behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. My reward is with me. When we think of reward, we think of a good thing. That's what our English, mean, our English word reward means. But notice the next phrase. I'm coming and I will render to each man according to his deeds. Earlier in the, in the book, in chapter 2, verse 23, where he says, I'm going to render to each one according to his deeds, that is a warning. That is a threat addressed to Jezebel and her followers in the church at Thyatira. God is going to render to us according to our deeds. Paul uses that same phrase, and by the way, it's an Old Testament quote. It's in several places in the Old Testament, particularly in Isaiah. I will render to each one according to his deeds. Paul spells it out in Romans chapter 2 that that means both ways. That means God will come for reward to those who serve him. There's the, the, the victor's wreath, the crown, the Greek word of Stephanos that we've seen over and over again in Revelation. 
God has for those who love him. God will render reward to those who have served him. And God will render according to their deeds to those who have rejected them. Both are true. Both are emphasized. Both are in view here. But the reward. God is at work in you, both to do and to will of his good pleasure, we're told in Philippians. God is working out his will in us. God has foreordained good deeds for you to do, according to Ephesians 2.10. And God, in his grace and mercy, wants to reward you for doing those good deeds that he put in your path. He wants to reward you for serving him when he enables you to serve him. He is coming to reward us. And then that statement in verse 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega. It's a fascinating statement. It recurs several times here in Revelation. There's a lot there. There's some interesting details there that I find fascinating, but they're they're, they're, they're not good sermon material. They're almost trivia. What are the key takeaways from that statement Jesus makes that he is the Alpha and the Omega? Let me give you the two most important takeaways from that statement. First of all, Jesus is God. My friends, you need to be sure on that one. The Apostle John tells us in 1 John, you get this one wrong, that's a fatal error. You need to understand that Jesus is God. I didn't say you need to understand the Trinity. The Trinity is bigger than we can understand. But accept and believe the clear statements in Scripture that Jesus is God. Earlier in the book of Revelation, back at the beginning when Jesus is first introducing himself to John, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, I am the Alpha and Omega, says whom? The Lord God, who was and who is and who is to come. And then here, I am coming quickly. I am the Alpha and the Omega. You see that in verses 12 and 13? Who is coming quickly? It's down at the end of the passage. Even so come Lord Jesus. Jesus is God. The Alpha and the Omega is a claim to that title. And by the way, Alpha and Omega, you've already figured it out, are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, like A and Z are of our alphabet. Um, our, our literacy specialist, uh, a linguist here, was saying nasty things about the English alphabet earlier today. <laughs> Spelling. Spelling, okay. Alpha and the Omega. Jesus is God. There's a Old Testament pa- several Old Testament passages in Isaiah that uh, highlight that. I keep referring to Isaiah today. Another Clear truth. Oh, by the way, one more thing about Jesus being God. That's what I put on the reverse side of your sermon notes today. A selection of verses, and by no means all of them, but a selection of the verses that highlight that Jesus is God. That's what's on the reverse side of your sermon notes for your future study and your your, your reference. But the other truth here about Jesus being the Alpha and the Omega is that Jesus is eternal. Jesus has been forever Yes, Jesus was born as a baby in Bethlehem sometime around 4 B.C., the way we've counted the calendar. They figure it's about four years off. Um, By the way, that's not not spelled out in Scripture, that date. You don't need to bank on it. That's, That's a deduction. But in any case, Jesus is eternal, and his birth was not his beginning. You're familiar with John 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Jesus has always been. God has always existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit forever. Jesus is eternal. A couple of Old Testament passages about that. This is Isaiah chapter 48. Listen to me, O Jacob, even Israel whom I called. 
I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. Surely my hand founded the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand together. Jesus is God. Jesus is eternal. Jesus is the first and the last. He's the creator. I don't know how it came up, but in a conversation in the last day or two, I was talking about the fact that there's a lot of cities with the same name, including the name Bethlehem. The various versions of the name Bethlehem are all over the world, including here in the U.S. of A. I was born in a city in Brazil that's named Belém, which is their version of Bethlehem. And um, you all are familiar with Belém, New Mexico, same town, Bethlehem. There's an Old Testament prophecy that you're familiar with that, that, that predicted that Bethlehem would be Jesus' birthplace and even specified which one and named not only the city but sort of uh, uh, the county would be an equivalent. This is Micah 5.2. As for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. And what else does it say about him? His going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Jesus is eternal. He always was. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He is God. And he is eternal. He's always been. Yes, he was born as a man 2,000 years ago. But he has always been. He's always been with God. I started out by overlapping just slightly with last week's passage and talking about keeping ourselves clean and keeping ourselves righteous and keeping ourselves holy. And now we get to verses 14 and 15 and, well, wait a minute, isn't that redundant? Um, 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 I should have lumped them together. That, 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 that's lousy sermon writing, right? No, it's emphasized over and over again in the passage, so I have it on there twice. Let's look at the next take, so to speak, the next way God makes this point. Verses 14 and 15. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. Two different aspects of it. Verse 14, be sanctified. Verse 15, a description of those who aren't, who aren't allowed into the city. And the sanctification here is emphasized sort of in, in, in two different ways, by one verse and then the other. First of all, Keeping, being clean initially, having your robes clean. Throughout the New Testament in particular, also the Old Testament, throughout Revelation, the white robes signify holiness, purity. Back in chapter 7, describing a different set of saved people, the tribulation saints, it tells us how we can have clean white robes. Revelation 7, 14. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. God uses that, that contrasting, challenging word picture, washing something white in blood to emphasize how he cleanses us, how we can be saved initially and in an ongoing way. The way you and I can be pure from sin, the way you and I can be forgiven, the only way anyone can be forgiven of their sin is by Jesus having paid for those sins. When we forgive, who shall I pick on? If Rich does something, if, 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 uh, if Rich owes me 50 bucks and I forgive him the debt, then I just let it go and I'm out 50 bucks, right? 
And by the way, that's what forgiveness means for us. It means letting go of it. God will not ignore sin. God is perfectly just. In order for God to forgive our sins, Jesus had to pay for those sins. The way we can be initially cleansed, the way we can come to God, the way we can receive what's called justification is through the blood of Christ. Through accepting his payment for your sins. And then there's ongoing cleansing as well. There's ongoing sanctification. Our lives need to be holy. We need to be becoming more holy. The Bible teaches very clearly salvation is something that happens in a sense once for all. And sanctification is also something ongoing. It's the ongoing part of our relationship with God now. Jesus is making us more holy. The Apostle Paul wrote at the end of 2 Corinthians, examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. If you are not becoming more holy, you need to ask yourself if you're saved in the first place. And then he has this list of sins there in verse 15. Outside are... Who's outside? What does it say? What's at the beginning of the list? Notice that reference. Uh, I don't have that reference up on a later screen, but we will talk about it on a later screen. You know, um, I know there aren't any dog lovers in the congregation, so I can say things about dogs. By the way, you know how many times cats are mentioned in Scripture? Zero. It mentions lions a lot. But as far back as the, the time when Israel was in Egypt as slaves, domesticated cats were a big deal. It's interesting, when God cursed the Egyptians, he didn't bother uh, um, uh, making an example of cats, he did locusts and frogs and so on. What does the Bible have to say about dogs? There are 40 references to dogs in the Bible. And almost all of them are negative. <laughs> let, me, let me share with you. One of them is kind of interesting and has a point to it. And the rest are just, just trivia. Um, all the positive, or, or sort of positive references to dogs I could find in the Bible. In Job, which is the oldest book in the Bible, there's a passing mention of sheep dogs. So at least dogs are useful, shepherd dogs. And um, let's see. Every dog I have owned in America is part shepherd. Every dog. Different kinds of shepherds. I had an Australian shepherd at one point. So sheep dogs. Okay. In Judges, in the story of Gideon, remember how God separated out his 300 uh, special forces from the bigger army? The ones that took water in their hands and maintained a posture of alertness. Uh, what's, what's the modern phrase? Situational awareness. The ones who lapped like a dog to get their water were the special forces. Okay, there's a positive mention of dogs. Um, remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus was crippled, very possibly paralyzed, so much so that the dogs licked his sores. That's a vivid picture. I don't know it's a positive statement about dogs. Let me share with you one more, and this is kind of a, an interesting one with a takeaway. Remember when Jesus was dealing with the Syrophoenician woman, the foreign woman whose daughter was demon-possessed, and she was pestering Jesus and his disciples for him to do something about it. And he said, no, I can't take the children's bread and throw it to the, the word there literally is puppies, the little dogs. Remember that? What was her response? She responded creatively. She responded wittily. She responded with a turn of phrase. She responded with a, a sense of humor. And Jesus healed her daughter. Jesus appreciates humor. And by the way, 
How do you and I respond when our prayers aren't answered the way we want them to the first time? All right, I'm taking my ball and going home. But here we have the statement, outside the city are dogs. What is that referring to? The answer to that puzzle, like so much else in Revelation, is back in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 23, there's instructions for the tabernacle and limitations on the offering for the tabernacle. Why would God limit the offering? You know what it says in Deuteronomy 23, 18, I believe the verse is, you will not bring the salary of a harlot, a prostitute, or of a dog into the tabernacle. What is that? That's a euphemism. A euphemism for what? A prostitute and a male prostitute. That's the meaning there. That's what it's talking about here in Revelation. A male prostitute. A sin so ugly that God uses a euphemism to refer to it. He doesn't spell it out. By the way, there's a lot of things that are, are spelled out pretty bluntly in Scripture. Some of them are sort of papered over by our English translations. My friends, that's what it's talking about with God, with dogs. Scripture is silent about whether there are dogs in heaven. I've read some ingenious uh, um, arguments about why there's got to be dogs in heaven. Okay, we'll see when we get there. I get emails from one of the, one of the Rapture Ready website guys, and a while back he came up with this argument about our pets are going to get raptured with us. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. <laughs> Do you know you can get rapture insurance for your pets? <laughs> if you get raptured, somebody will come take care of your pets while you're in heaven. <laughs> Looking at it seriously and soberly, verse 15, outside are the dogs, the sorcerers. Do you practice witchcraft? You cast black magic spell on anybody recently? The immoral persons, that doesn't need any definition. The murderers, is that a big one? Is murder kind of, kind of up there on the, on the severity of sins? The idolaters, God hates, God abominates idolatry. And what's the last one on the list? Lying is mentioned twice in lists of sins in the previous chapter. Lying, lying. A few verses on down, we'll look at um, the verse that says, don't take away from Scripture. That kind of sort of an exception to what I'm about to say. But the first... Sin mentioned in the Bible was when Satan lied to Eve. You will not surely die. The last sin mentioned in the Bible is lying. My friends, God is truth. The book of Revelation was written to instruct and encourage, by the way, people going through persecution. When you're going through persecution, there's a tendency to fudge a little bit on the truth to try to avoid negative consequences. And we can even rationalize it in times of persecution. Well, we've we, we got to do it. No, God says, don't practice lying. In what arena are we being pressured into lying in our culture today? Our culture, you're right, our culture wants to pressure us into lying about the reality, the fact, the truth that God created male and female in his image. And our culture wants to pressure us into lying with pronouns. If we give in on that seemingly little thing, Will that relieve the pressure? No, they will triple down and there will be the next lie that we have to buy into and so on and so on. A little piece of good news about that. 
This past week, the state of Idaho became the ninth state in the union, that's nine out of 52, the ninth state in the union to pass a law forbidding state institutions, especially focused on schools, from forcing their employees to use false pronouns. Day for Idaho. But that's nine out of 52 states. And Arizona ain't one of them. Outside the city is this list of sins, beginning with one that's so ugly God uses a euphemism for. And the one at the end is lying. My friends, speak truth to one another. That's from Ephesians chapter 4. I could pound the pulpit more on that, but there's so much more here. Look at verse 16. I, Jesus, see that? I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. I, Jesus, Look up the page, or scroll up the page if you're on one of those things. Look up the page at verse 8. I, John. You see that? The human and the divine author of the book together identify themselves here in the close of the book to reinforce the authority of the book. God sent this message. And how does Jesus describe himself? He is the root and the offspring of David, the root and the descendant of David. How can, you know, uh, is Rick back there? I don't see Rick. Rick likes to sing, I'm my old grandpa. Where'd Rick go? He was here earlier today. Rick likes to sing, I'm my old grandpa. And if you know his uh, his, 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 uh, family story there, it's kind of amusing. How can Jesus be both David's ancestor and David's descendant? Jesus gave that as a riddle, quoting a passage from the Psalms to the religious leaders. That's recorded in Matthew chapter 22. Is that right? Yeah, I did get it right. Matthew 22. Jesus puzzled them with it. We know the answer. Jesus created David. And when Jesus was born as a man, he was born as a descendant of David. He is the root and the offspring of David. And then the warning. I'm skipping verse 17 for a minute. I will come back to it. Verse 18. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. The warning, the command, the challenge is obvious. Jesus wrote the book. Don't mess with it. Okay. How does that apply to you and me? Are you likely to do like Muhammad did and sit down and write your own holy book? Are you likely to do like Joe Smith did, sit down and write your own holy book? Anybody have that temptation this week? (laughs) You started your... your (laughs) Is anybody likely to do like um, Thomas Jefferson did and take the scissors to the Bible and chop out the parts you don't like? We say no. And yet, let me illustrate. I have eaten at Golden Corral's from Prescott, Arizona to Pensacola, Florida. And when we had a Golden Corral here in Safford, actually in Thatcher, it was the worst one of the bunch. (laughs) I'm not surprised they lost their franchise. And this is two Sundays in a row I've ripped all the local restaurants. Uh, Is there a restaurant association? They're going to sue me. Really, our church supports the restaurants. Our men's fellowship rotates the main restaurants, and our after-church fellowship rotates the fast food. We're we're all good with restaurants here. Golden Corral, why do I bring up Golden Corral? We, that's you and I, have the tendency to come at God's holy word like it's a buffet from which we can pick and choose. 
you'll take the steak and the pulled pork and leave the green beans and the black-eyed peas. If that's what you do at the buffet, more power to you. I'm, I'm not judging you for that. Um, but don't come to God's word with a pick and choose attitude about what you will believe and what you won't, what you will live by and what you won't. We tend to want to accept the nice passages and claim the promises and ignore the tough passages and the challenges. We like the nice Jesus that loved children and, and was compassionate on grieving widows and healed people and so on and so on. We don't want to hear about the Jesus that cleansed the temple and that told the religious leaders they were hypocrites and that's presented here in the book of Revelation as the judge. Can't pick and choose. This is God's word defining who God is, describing who God is. Don't come to it with a pick and choose attitude. My friends, Jesus taught more about hell than anyone else. And here in the book of Revelation, we've seen the lake of fire, the second death described. And Jesus is the judge that will send people there if they reject him. That is God's truth recorded in God's word and testified to by Jesus himself. You can't skip over it, pretend it's not there, like you ignore the black-eyed peas at the buffet. Don't add to or remove from God's word. Still in that passage, the warning there, and I wanted to highlight something in that warning. Verse 19, if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. I mentioned this three, four weeks ago when we were talking about uh, the, the, the numbers describing the new Jerusalem in Revelation chapter 21, I was a little bit critical of, of, of our New American Standard Bible because they disguised the twelves in the numbers by converting them to modern measures. Excuse me a minute. I said it then, there is no such thing as a perfect translation. Right, Chris? There is no such thing as a perfect translation. The King James Bible is the most elegant, the most poetic, and one of the most, literate, most uh, literal translations of the Bible in the English language. It's unquestionably, without peer, the most elegant and the most poetic and beautifully worded I love the way the King James Bible uh, renders, for example, um, Revelation chapter 1. To him who loved us and hath washed us from our sins by his blood, and hath made us to be a kingdom, a priest, and a holy nation. To him be honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Revelation chapter 1, about verses 4 and 5. By the way, Sabrina, that's a beautiful piece you, you penned. Did you all notice who, whose song was the offertory this morning? Based in part on that passage. But why did I bring up the King James Version? The King James Version is based on Erasmus' compilation of Greek manuscripts of the Bible. Some of them he had purchased, some of them had been given to him, and some of them were borrowed. He did not have, there did not seem to be existent at that time, a copy of the Greek New Testament, he borrowed a copy of a, a, an ancient Greek commentary 
on Revelation to compile his New Testament. It was Revelation that there wasn't a text existent for. He borrowed a commentary on Revelation that had been written by a guy named Andreas of Caesarea back in the 12th century. And Erasmus borrowed this from a, of the, its owner, a, a nobleman by the name of Reuchlin. That commentary had the Greek text written in it. You've looked at a commentary of the Bible. It has the text and then someone's writing below. That's how it was written out. That was Erasmus' source of the Greek New Testament. And he used it for his compilation of the Greek New Testament on, from which the King James was translated. Erasmus did not have the last six verses of Revelation. So in order to have a complete text, he back-translated it from the Latin Bible, the Latin Vulgate, into Greek so we'd have a complete Greek text. How do we know that? He said so in a letter he wrote to a guy by the name of Edward Lee, and that letter is still in existence. So we know that. Erasmus compilation based on the Latin, and the Latin had a mistake in it based on two similar Latin words. Erasmus' compilation says that God will not take away your name from the, or God it warns that God will take away your name from the book of life. The book of life. And that's what shows up in the King James Bible and some others, the book of life. In chapter 2, we have the promise, no, chapter 3, we have the promise that God will not remove our names from the book of life. The book of life, God's record of those who are saved, is not written in pencil. We're told in Timothy, the Lord knows those who are his. You're in it or you're not. What's the threat here? You misuse God's word. You won't have access to the tree of life in the New Jerusalem. The tree of life. The correct Wording here is tree of life. We know that for sure because since Erasmus' time, they've come up with a lot more early manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. God will not take away your name from the book of life. He will exclude you from access to the tree of life. I told you I would come back to verse 17. Verse 17 the spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Throughout the book of Revelation, we've seen pronouncements, enactments, even seems like pageants in heaven before things happen on earth. The first four seals are opened and a voice from one of the living creatures says, come, and the four horsemen of the revelation ride forth, come. Enactments in heaven. Here we are at the end of the book and we've stepped away from the, the future aspect of it. This is the this is now, this is us now. Jesus says, I've written these things for the churches. We're the churches now. Who is doing the enactment? Who is doing the invitation here? God's Holy Spirit and the bride. Who's the bride? We are the church. It's our job now to be inviting people to come to Jesus. It seems so awesome, you know, one of the four living creatures or one of the angels that had the seven bowls makes a pronouncement in heaven and massive stuff happens here on earth. Right now, we are the ones making that pronouncement that people need to get saved. People need to get right with God. That's our task. And whom should we invite there's two descriptions of the people who can come. Whoever is thirsty may come. 
Here in Arizona, it's a dry state, right? We're all dehydrated all the time. And talking makes you dehydrated. I go home parched every Sunday, even though you see me with a cup in my hand all morning on Sunday. Have you ever been caught up in something, been busy, didn't bother to stop and notice that you were thirsty until you got to that point where you were dizzy and lightheaded and realized you had a splitting headache coming on? My wife passed out that way once. Woke up on the floor. My friends, we all have a built-in need for, desire for God, but too many of us ignore it too much of the time. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, that they may be satisfied. Are you thirsty for God? Are you thirsty enough to come? Look again at the verse. What's the other descriptor of those who come? Whoever wishes. We talked about King James. The King James phrase is, whosoever will. Isn't that poetic? Whosoever will may come. Whoever wishes may come. What a beautiful, what a simple picture of salvation. Come to him and receive freely the gift of the water of life. By the way, that's a picture of a creek coming down from Mount Hermon in northern Israel, border of Israel and Lebanon. Come and drink of the water of life freely. The invitation is for everybody. Everybody is invited. The people who reject the invitation, that's on them. Yes, God chooses. Yes, Jesus has the Lamb's book of life. Yes, election is taught in Scripture. But the invitation is for everybody. And our task as the bride is to extend the invitation to everybody. And whoever wishes may come. Back up to verse 11. If you want to be, do wrong, keep on doing wrong. If you want to be filthy, go on being filthy. But if you want to be holy, come to Jesus and receive freely of the water of life. It's a free gift. And then the very close of the book, very at the end. Verse 20, who testifies to these things says, I am coming quickly. Jesus is coming quickly. John's response should be ours. Come, Lord Jesus. And verse 21, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Do you know what the last verse in the Old Testament is? The last word in the Old Testament. You know what the last word in the Old Testament is? Curse. Malachi 4 ends with the phrase, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. Wow, that's a happy ending. Are you glad we're in the age of grace? The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Jesus in his grace invites everyone to come and drink freely of the water of life. Jesus in his grace invites everyone to come and wash your robes in the blood of the Lamb and be made white by Jesus' sacrifice. Come, drink freely. Be one of those that will partake of the tree of life in God's new Jerusalem. Let's pray. Our Father God, we worship you. We acknowledge the greatness, the majesty, the beauty of your plan for humanity. We are awed by the awesomeness of your salvation, the price that Jesus paid so that we can have life offered freely to us. Lord, I pray that each one of us would walk in holiness 
that we would be keeping ourselves pure. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here that has not accepted your offer to come and drink freely of the water of life, that you would give them no rest, that you would give them no peace, that you would uh, uh, ring in their ears the invitation to come until they come to you. Lord, I thank you for your closing blessing, and I claim that blessing and the blessing in chapter 1 for those who read and heed. I claim that blessing for each of us, and I pray that we would heed to earn it. Thank you that you choose to reward us for the good deeds that you've placed before us. And Lord Jesus, with the Apostle John, we cry, even so come. Amen. Today's closing benediction is the benediction at the close of the book. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with all. Amen. Go with God.